this computer. New share. Okay, so I think we're recording. Okay, um, I've got this microphone thing here. Sorry, one sec, audio. Test mic and speaker. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Um, so I've got a lot to cover. I had to whittle this talk down from 150 slides um, down to only 50. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm still gonna try to tell a story here. But the story is how Kubernetes has pretty much changed like everything um, that my company Pipeline, uh, it like used to be Pipeline IO, I was just telling someone this. Um, when you start like doing the fundraising process, people want to see AI, you know, these like VCs. I'm going to rip on VCs the whole time probably. Um, and I just happened to mention to one that I have pipeline.ai, but I, it was kind of weird. I, I, you know, liked IO. It sounded kind of cool. And they're like, no, 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 drop the IO. Yeah, that was like 2015 or whatever, right? So um, we have pipeline ML too, which is kind of cool. But uh, so I started this company and, you know, really like Docker, um, and specifically Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows has changed quite a bit uh, or has sort of opened up new use cases here. So, right, like before to get Docker running locally, you had to you know, do all this janky stuff with VirtualBox and you had to know a lot about networking and um, it's stuff that you didn't really want to worry about as a data scientist, right? This is like, yeah, so today's talk will pretty much be from the data scientist standpoint. And then, you know, how things at Pipeline, which is totally open source, by the way, this is the other problem that the VCs have, uh, is that they're, you know, I'm trying to convince them that people are going to pay for this stuff, uh, but, you, you know, it's all for free. So um, this is not a product pitch or anything. Uh, it's just to show you this code base is about a year and a half old in its current form. Um, we've been developing, obviously, yes, every day. Uh, it's about, you know, 12, 13, like, contributors. Um, got a bunch of stars here. Yeah, pretty happy about that. Um, I'm going to show a slide here in a sec that puts a or like a dollar value, um, you know, based on these like blood sucking VCs. Uh, what what they value each star? Okay. Um, and yeah, so Docker for Mac really sort of opened up the ability to package up your machine learning model into a runtime and then seal it up and make it immutable. And so this is really powerful because before, uh, I came from like Netflix, um, worked a bit at the IBM Spark Tech Center, worked for Databricks, um, and you know, kind of saw lots of like machine learning use cases and kind of the systems level side of it. And uh, it's so frustrating for a data scientist to train a model with Jupyter Notebook or you know, train it with Scikit uh, using IPython, whatever. Um, and not have anywhere for it to go, right? And so uh, then comes along TensorFlow, right? Which we're huge fans of, of course. Um, it's not just the buzz and the 86,000 stars that it has on uh, like GitHub, but it's also the first time that you really see these machine learning libraries focus on production and like runtime characteristics and give you knobs to turn, right? Like with that. Um, and one thing that, that we're laser focused on is giving data scientists the ability to not just hyperparameter tune, you know, choose different knobs and turn different knobs at the training part, but also the runtime. And so this way we can actually burn in different versions. Uh, it's, or, sorry, it's, it's the same model, but they're just turning knobs that TensorFlow gives you at runtime for the prediction. Okay? So you could like change the request batch size. You could batch up 50 uh, like log lines or you know 50 requests and score them all together, right? And you would wait like uh, five milliseconds or something. So under very high load, this is super powerful. Um, right, like versus treating each one. And think of when you're scoring with a, a GPU, for example. I'm going to mention GPUs a couple times. Uh, right, like these things take time to get from CPU RAM into the GPU. It's the classic PCIe Express you know problem. Uh, and the less trips that you make and the larger the payload, right, this is actually good for these GPUs. Um, so I don't think we'll get to it, but I've got uh, a demo that's actually using the Amazon SageMaker project that, or uh, like product that just, um, it was just announced at 
uh, the reInvent conference back in November. Um, and it's called SageMaker, like, you know, you can see into the future kind of thing. Um, it was formerly Iron Man, so, like, you'll actually see some, like, old references in there called Iron Man. But, um, uh, yeah, so I have that where it can spin up GPUs. Um, they don't use Kubernetes, yes, as we all know. Uh, they announced EKS, the Elastic uh, Kubernetes Service, um, that I'm sure we've all signed up for and have heard absolutely nothing. Uh, so they're like basically, as best as I can tell, using uh, that, like, um, what uh, the ECS service, right? The Elastic uh, like Container Service. And, but it's totally hidden from you. So one cool thing about SageMaker is that you're not forced to use the Amazon models which are you know, super uh, like highly tuned for S3 and for um, their uh, like particular cloud environment, um, but they give you one hook. And, and yes, I was surprised about this um, when I first saw the release. So you can upload just an arbitrary Docker image. And as long as it listens on, I don't know, port like 8080 uh, and can take an HTTP post, right? Like you can do anything. And so, um, we, we caught wind of SageMaker about uh, three or four months before. They basically went to the Pipeline AI website. Um, this is as best I can tell. I haven't actually confirmed this. And went down this list of some of our early beta users and contacted a bunch of them and said, hey, you see that you're using Pipeline. We have something similar. Uh, what kind of features you know, from Pipeline do you like? So, Because I heard from you know, three or four of these people all around the same time. Uh, that the Amazon folks were kind of fishing, you know, to see what's out there. So um, we kind of knew, right, like we were building something like SageMaker, which is an infrastructure to deploy your models. Um, and so instead of fighting this, we're just kind of, we're like taking advantage of the fact that they let you upload an arbitrary Docker image, and now we're going to compete on the runtime performance, because they're not really interested in that, um, right, like necessarily. So, or their models are, you know, tuned for sort of offline training and not necessarily for the runtime. So. Most of the machine learning I'll be talking about today is gonna to be the real-time stuff. So uh, think of the application developer, um, instead of accessing a database like they typically would, right? they're gonna access a REST endpoint or uh, you know, Kafka stream, they'll put data on a Kafka stream, um, and this stuff needs to be scored within right, like milliseconds, not necessarily uh, scored offline and then you know, uploaded to a, to a database later on, you know, with, like recommendations, something like that. This is, you know, very high throughput, like very, very fast latency, right, like low latency type stuff. So um, one thing that we use Kubernetes, oh, and, and so Docker for Mac really made this happen because we can now on this, their like personal laptop or their uh, like work laptop, they can actually build this bundle, right? That's the Docker, um, it's, it's the model plus the model runtime. So the classic problem with like scikit-learn, for example, is, um, you might be working with it locally, you know, version 0.9 or 0.192 or whatever. Um, when you go to deploy, it's using, you know, 0.20 or something like that, right? So this way, when you burn the immutable Docker image, you know that that runtime is there, and it's it's the exact same runtime locally through dev through test. So when you tag that Docker image, right, like you would use the same get, uh, right, like Git hash, um, uh, and Right, that's used for the model when you actually uh, like commit the model into source control. So you can tie everything together. Um, and so by doing this now, the data scientists can actually create different versions. And what we're seeing with TensorFlow is there's a lot of new runtimes popping up. Um, I work with a couple chip manufacturers, kind of smaller startups that are trying to compete with uh, the NVIDIA GPUs. So just you know, stepping back a sec, there's a lot of pressure on uh, like the NVIDIA folks um, because, right, like their GPUs just kind of came on the scene. Like, oh yeah, by the way, we actually do matrix math really well. Um, and it's not just graphics and texture rendering and that kind of thing. So there's, there's some thought here that they're not, that their chips are not optimized for deep learning, right? And specifically inference side of it, you know, the like prediction side of things. So there's a lot of these new chips popping up. Uh, one clear example that's pretty common is the TPU, right? The Google Tensor Processing Unit. And of course that thing is highly tuned for right, like tensor operations. First version of that chip was optimized for the forward propagation, which is the inference, the prediction, right? Like through these networks. Um, the second generation is a bit more uh, like general. Uh, at the same time, the NVIDIA folks are taking their GPU and they're starting to add tensor cores to it, right? So 
it's not just training, but they could also right, like figure out uh, that this is a typical forward propagation, which is typically something times something, right? Like two matrices multiplied and then adding in a bias. So it's you know A times B plus C. And when the actual CUDA layer, right, the C layer can detect this and shift it over to the tensor cores, um, which are fully optimized for uh, that particular uh, right, like numerical calculation. Uh, so, let me figure, okay, so I can get, let me pull up the slide thing. Um, uh, yeah, I want to be careful on time here. Yes, yeah, so I'll be posting this. Uh, I'll put it in the actual, right, like meetup comments. Um, I'm just going to upload it to SlideShare and then you guys uh, can pull it down. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of things. I'm probably going to skip around a lot. I'm, you know, kind of a spaz when it comes to my like presentation style uh, because I, I start going down stories that I think are interesting, and uh, yeah, hopefully you guys do too. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip through this, but yeah, we really actually released SageMaker support the week after it was announced uh, because our designs were so similar, right? With this like Docker image being kind of the central point. Um, and then, let's see, yeah, just real quick, Netflix, Databricks, IBM. Uh, this is um, my meetup in San Francisco, but we're also global. We have about 12 chapters right, like throughout the world, uh, 60,000 people. I have a slide on this because this is only a 30-minute slot, uh, which I've, I've burned like half of it up right now. But um, there's tons of like YouTube videos and slide shares. There's you know, two and a half years of like material out there. Um, I've been fortunate because of the size of, of the San Francisco meetup, which is about 9,200 people, I think we hit 9,300, um, where I can actually get good speakers. This wasn't the case. I actually did the first um, eight months of you know, meetups because I couldn't get anyone to show up. Um, what was cool is I, it, it started off the Advanced Spark uh, meetup because I was at Databricks, and I was there at a time when they were starting to try to be more like Oracle. Right? That's kind of their dream is to be Oracle. And, uh, and they actually stopped doing meetups for a while. In fact, I'm you know, pretty vocal on Twitter. I always just kind of rip on them because it's fun. Um, and, and it gets under their skin, which is hilarious. Uh, so the, the first you know, five or six meetups were, were me like diving deep into the Spark code days. That's the advanced part. And you know, because like, people have questions, like how is this stuff working? And not unless you actually work, you know, sit right like, next to these uh, like Databricks, right, like Spark developers and the committers, do you really understand the code base? So, um, yeah, that actually worked really well. And then we added TensorFlow, not June last year, June the year before. Um, and we've got a lot of TensorFlow people and uh, right, like Google people that have, been, that have spoken. And, yeah, there's all the videos there. Um, yeah, just kind of, I assume you guys are kind of, you know, sort of interested. This is the, like, target audience, people trying to get models into production. Now, right, yeah, so this term production is different depending on who you talk to. If you talk to a data scientist uh, or, like, a data analyst, you know, it's taking their, like, R model uh, that's, you know, using a sample data set that fits on their laptop, and it's pointing it to an S3 bucket or, you know, something uh, with huge data. Um, when you talk to the application developer, their version of production, you know, is like a REST endpoint or, you know, some, some Kafka stream, something like that. So um, there's sort of batch production, which, right, like we're not really focused too much on. And then there's the sort of real-time production. So that's one thing I've picked up throughout the, the last year. Um, if you guys don't know, there's this, this cool project. It's called uh, Red Dwarf. Um, yeah, search Red Dwarf GitHub, by the way. Don't just search Red Dwarf. There's a lot of weird shit that comes back. Um, but you can actually point it to um, a public repo, and it'll go through all the forkers and the watchers and the stargazers, and um, we'll you know, like figure out where they're from and yeah, build this little heat map. So what was interesting, I, I should probably put both, because about a year ago, it was just San Francisco. It was, it was probably just my house. Uh, and we've, we've kind of now expanded to you know, London and uh, right, like New York and that kind of stuff. Um, spent a lot of time like down in Australia, uh, and so yeah, that's been popping up. Um, so one kind of funny thing, sort of anecdotal about Silicon Valley area, which is where I live, uh, San Francisco. Um, I had, yes, I was speaking with a pretty famous VC um, who I shouldn't name because I'm trying to get money out of them. Uh, but I, you know, like pointed out that we have 2,000 stars. 
And their comment was, okay, 2,000 stars, uh, to us, that's $3 million. That's the cap. And the next step up is 6,000 stars. And uh, that was like 10 million. So it probably wasn't linear. You know, it was just kind of a weird, um, you know, sort of arbitrary. But uh, what this maps to is this is what you need to get seed money, which for the cap is, you know, 3 million for this particular VC. Uh, so if you do the math, you know, the, the, the complex division, uh, it's 1,500 um, per star. So please star this repo uh, that will put, put more money in my pocket so I can keep making trips up here. Uh, just some numbers, this is kind of producty stuff. Uh, the key one here, yeah, the Docker downloads. These guys have been super influential. Now, I'm not gonna say these people are actually paying customers because we don't even have like a, a something to pay for, but this is kind of my extended Netflix network actually. Like quite a few of these people, you know, they're at Twitter, they're at Apple now, um, and I've been pinging them, you know, at, in like the like first phases and, okay, you're a data scientist, like how did we do this at Netflix? What was wrong with it back there? What are you doing at your new place? Um, I should have pager duty in here too. Those guys have been really helpful. Um, and one big one was that whole dependency library thing where you would, you know, put the model out and it would just break because you didn't realize that, uh, you know, so like hardening into the Docker, um, that uh, like Docker image. Um, I should, yeah, so let me just like mention uh, like one thing about Kubernetes too. So there's Kubernetes for Docker map. Has anyone actually got that like working? Yeah, right. yeah, who here has gotten like has, so the latest Docker, um, Edge, it's not the stable version, actually has uh, like Kubernetes built into it. And it's version, I think, 1.82. So it's, you know, fairly current. Um, and you can spin up a Kubernetes. So like that whole mini cube thing, right? Like kind of reminded me of like, you know, the uh, like virtual box for Docker. And, it, you know, it's kind of hokey. And it, you, you had to do things differently for, to get, you know, service endpoints. And it was always lagging behind the main project. Um, and I'm not sure if this is going to be much better in terms of lag, uh, but it's so nice to, you know, have a little like Docker thing up there and then show that the Kubernetes cluster is healthy. And um, that's really changed a lot because um, while in production, we always run on a Kubernetes cluster when I want people to actually try things out locally and kind of get, you know, a feel for things. Um, right. Like basically like, we had to take all of our services and put them into one Docker image, all the dashboards and all that. Um, and it just, you know, made for a huge bloat. So now we can have separate Docker images the exact same way that we do um, in production, but they can run it locally. Uh, so, yeah, you know, for every, uh, like, 100 training jobs that are happening per day, there's, you know, millions of these predictions happening per second. So this is another reason. One thing that, that is really cool about this, uh, like open source project pipeline is we can actually uh, take the runtime characteristics, right? So think of like latency for your predictions. This is 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds, and tie that back to the hyperparameter tuning that's happening offline. So, you know, right, like offline, these people are changing the depth of the decision trees or the number of, um, right, like layers in their neural network. And when you do one in like just like total isolation, you're like optimizing for the offline case, but you could add, you know, 50 more layers and yeah, that's going to be really good on the training side and you'll get really high accuracy. Uh, but at runtime now it takes like 1.5 seconds to do one prediction. Right. And so that's the feedback. There's a certain, you know, point. And so that just like literally doesn't exist today. And so that's the kind of bridge that we're getting that um, we're, that's the kind of gap that we're bridging. Um, one other thing to mention, there's a lot of optimizations um, at the runtime uh, that are just not being explored. And unfortunately, they're very systems-y because TensorFlow, uh, like for example, is very, very, you know, it's built on C++. Uh, there's, you know, uh, like Python bindings. Um, but there's so many optimizations that can be done, even with your static model, right? Like you can post-process uh, like that 50 layers and, you know, fuse together a bunch of layers. And, you know, these are things that the data scientist probably like, doesn't even know they can do. Uh, and so we're trying to make those knobs, um, right, like available. And, and our target is to do all this, of course, within Jupyter Notebook and probably like, get that whole end-to-end -end thing out. So, um, yeah, so we kind of say that we extend 
the model validation step. It, so it's not just being done offline here. It's it like continues into production and we're kind of uh, building on some of these like Netflix canary releases and you know some of these like best practices for them for like micro just like normal microservices um, where you can you know push out the new version of your model to just one percent traffic or even shadow traffic that's the current project um, that we're pushing towards so like you could put a model out that is asynchronously getting um, right like these like inputs uh, but that main model the the current right, like control model, if you will, uh, is still returning um, right, like that prediction back to the user. So to have a dashboard that can show shadowed uh, like predictions alongside the actual predictions is pretty powerful. So let's see, I have seven minutes left, <laughs> and I have a bunch of demos. Um, this is an example. You know, this is how. So this is our CLI again. This is all open source. Um, if you notice, uh, this is probably the most uh, rather interesting slide here on this. You, you give it the model of your path, that's pretty, or the path of your model. You give it, if you want to try like the GPU version, right, like we have TPU also, we have, you know, um, as new ones come out, you can have those. You can actually change runtimes. So here, we're just using TensorFlow Serving, um, and specifically the GPU version, right, which if anyone's actually tried to get that to build, like I've spent weeks just trying to maintain, uh, because to get, uh, TensorFlow serving um, to build on CPU, that's hard enough, but now you have GPU and you have all the CUDA shit and all the, you know, um, yeah, it's a nightmare. So uh, that takes up actually quite a bit of time. Um, but there's this new runtime by the NVIDIA folks. So it's still for the same GPU, the NVIDIA GPU, uh, but they can do a lot of that, that post-processing. And it's called Tensor RT. And so that would be like another, you know, it, if I'm building three different versions, I would have CPU, um, I would have GPU, both TensorFlow serving for the runtime, and then I'd have a third one that would be TensorRT GPU. And there's that extra post-processing step. So I say post because it's post the training phase. So you've trained your model, you've got your weights, uh, you know, at, at each node, at each layer, and you want to then do something after that to, to like create, it's sort of an intermediate representation that this TensorRT Right, like think of it like bytecode, right, in like Java land or whatever. Um, they're generating some some bytecode, like, um, and their like TensorRT runtime can then pick that up, and it's it's fully optimized. You know, this is written by these like CUDA ninjas, uh, and so the, right, like they know these GPUs really well. Um, the latest version of TensorRT, which is 3.0, I think, uh, or 3.01, I think 3.02 comes out this week. Um, has full support for the new Volta chip, which is like blazing fast um, on both training and the inference. Uh, there's like tricks that they do where they can take weights um, that are 32 bit, right? Like when you train, you typically want to have higher weight or right, like higher, um, right, like precision or the number of bits um, per float, right, that you're like working with. Uh, that gives you better accuracy. When you go to actually Right, like make the prediction and just do the forward propagation, um, the smaller and smaller you can make those, you can quantize them down from 32 bit down to 8 bit, for example. When you multiply two of, right, like two 8 bits, uh, that's way faster than multiplying two right, like full floating point 32. Um, that's also true on the training side as well too. So what we're starting to see is people actually drop the precision at training time. So not do it at full 32 bit, just drop it down to 16 bit. Now you can get through your training faster, right? Like twice as fast. Because actually, one thing to mention: these uh, like GPU cores um, uh, are 32 bit cores, right? So they take 32. And if you drop down to 16 bit, right? Like you could actually put two 16 bit, um, right? Like floats into one 32 bit core. And so that's a right, yeah, that's just a no brainer. That's a 2x speed up. And so why you want to do that, right? Yeah, there's obvious reasons why you'd want to train faster. Um, because you don't really know the data yet, right? And you're, you're still trying to figure out the hyperparameters. Um, and so if you can get through it twice as fast, uh, you sort of get the intuition about the data and then drop it. Uh, then go back to the full 32 bit if you choose. Yeah. So you're, <clears throat> are you telling us that you're, you're using a Kubernetes cluster to test the graphic global processor unit? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not supposed to spend too much time on questions. That's kind of the like organizer's rule. Yeah, that's, that's not my rule. 
Um, yeah, but my like meetups usually go till 1030 at night. So <laughs> yeah, this is a good rule to get people moving. Um, but yes, so the Kubernetes cluster can take any Docker image. Uh, getting Kubernetes to work with GPUs is a nightmare. It's, there's tons of you know, crap you have to do. Um, but, and it, it changes a little bit here and there, and it's very touchy. So the combination of Docker, Kubernetes, TensorFlow, CUDA, uh, CUDNN, which is the like, deep neural network built on top of CUDA by the NVIDIA folks, yes. And the uh, like, most interesting one that like, not a lot of people know about is that the Linux kernel is super, so yes, yeah, so all of these versions have to work. And so this is why if you ever follow someone's blog post and you, you know, follow the steps exactly and it's the exact same Amazon AMI or so you think, or it's not the exact same AMI, but it's, it's like the Ubuntu 1604, you know? So if you go to spin up, um, you just specify, you know, uh, 1604 or whatever. The problem here is that they're always revving, right? Like that Linux kernel. And so your version of 1604 is different than the person who wrote the blog post, and so everything's all fucked. And so you think that they're a bozo and they didn't actually get this to work, when really what you need to do, like when you provision, and I, um, yes, I do uh, like a monthly workshop as well too. Um, I was in London and, and, uh, and like realized uh, that the particular, I think it was, was it Google or like the Amazon? Yeah. So somehow I got pinned to a different version because I wasn't pinning to a specific, uh, um, yeah, how do they do it? It's like by dates, right? So they'll say this is the Ubuntu and um, If you don't pin to one, it's just completely random, right? I mean, it's just a nightmare to get all of those to work, but yeah, like essentially you're poking a hole through docker um, mounting a GPU um, Just right like as another device and kubernetes builds on top of that uh, When you go to deploy your app you, you say I want four CPUs for this service, and I want two GPUs, yeah. And that's really, that, that was my 2017, was like getting all this to work, and then, um, yeah. And what's cool is that you can actually, uh, when you deploy a model that's been built for the GPU, you tell Kubernetes, find me a node that has a GPU, or don't schedule, just fail the scheduling. Uh, right, because like Kubernetes is trying to place these Docker images or right, like these containers around the cluster, and what I, I'm I'm starting to see now because we're seeing you know we've seen like two or three generations of GPUs the past uh, right like three or four years, we're starting to see a lot of heterogeneous. Um, so it's the old K80, you know the uh, Tesla K80 or whatever, um, and then there's the P100 and the V100, which is the brand new one, and you have to be very careful where you get placed. Because if you have compiled TensorFlow for the V100 and it ends up on a K80, that's a disaster. These, these chips have what's called a compute capability, and that's kind of, it's just some arbitrary number, you know, it's incremental. Um, but the dot releases, you know, this is all managed by NVIDIA, so they can like make up whatever they want. Um, so, in the, you know, 6.1 and 6.2 means something different than 7.1 and 7.2 because they decided to change things. So, um, yeah, the summary there is it's a complete nightmare. Um, and if you care about your family and want to actually spend time with them, uh, yeah. Right, like one thing about TensorFlow I see a lot of people do is they, they think that they, they have to go straight to GPUs. And um, that's kind of the wrong thing to do. Like, right, like just get your model working on CPUs first and then, you know, spend the month with your, like, ops group trying to get that working. Um, so this is all local, right? So this is a local model server. I'm calling start. I'm giving it memory. Um, and this is actually the local, so this is without the, the, that like Kubernetes running locally. This is just pure Docker. It's just one Docker container. So this is how we were rolling up until this past weekend when I was able to get the Kubernetes. My demo is up to date and is doing local Kubernetes so I can show that. And then, yeah, so here's a quick load test. I can actually run like a thousand predictions on my right, like laptop. And while it's not production, it, it can still give you sort of a relative, uh, you know, version A um, took, you know, 25 milliseconds. There's a little dashboard too that um, is showing latency and, you know, kind of throughput. This is all locally, but it, if you 
right? Like remember running this and it was 10 milliseconds and now this new model, right? Like locally, it's now taking 50 milliseconds, right? So that's a hint that you really right, like didn't go the right direction. Um, and so there's really no need to even push this out into production. Just right, like, yeah, just package it up, test it, and then throw it away if it's right, like really uh, sort of weird. And so this lets you actually experiment as though you're, you're like in production with all the dependencies. Um, push it to the Docker registry. I think I'll skip through this. This is just some of the um, post-training optimizations, quantizing. Yes, I was talking about that 32-bit fusing. Um, there's also, yeah, so there's different runtimes, like I mentioned. There's also like runtime configuration. These are the knobs that we're trying to give people to try out. Um, one thing that's funny is that's linear regression from TensorFlow, right? and that's right after it's been trained. And right, it, so that's not what you want to deploy, right? Like when you're going to actually do the predictions, right? Like you don't want all the back propagation nodes, there's like 92 nodes or something there because that's not important during serving time. Um, there's another thing called TF compile that's kind of this mysterious thing that is now actually uh, kind of bled into what's called TensorFlow Lite, but yeah, let me step back here. So this is where, like you'd actually give it, so, so this is a binary that if you build TensorFlow from source, like you'll see it, um, if you just do the, the like pip install, you won't see it. You actually would point that to your graph, right, your neural network, um, tell it which node to start at and which output, what node to, to end, and that's your prediction. And this TF compile goes through and plucks from the TensorFlow runtime just the bare minimum, right? Those like C++ SO files, right? The object files. It says, yeah, that one's needed, this one's needed. Um, and from the actual Linux operating system too, from the actual operating system can pull in uh, just the kernels that are needed, right? Like the, the specific, uh, functions and so what's cool about that is you now the like output of this is a C++ library that can get pulled into your custom binary that gets deployed out to a sensor or something super duper like low uh, like memory right um, and yeah so if you don't do this the TensorFlow runtime itself has to be fully loaded and that's 50 meg and then uh, you, you have to have the operating system you know fully loaded on the off chance that you might call something, but you know that you're not gonna call, right, like 99% of the functions, and all you need is matrix multiply and you know, uh, vector add, whatever. So, yeah, this is where you start seeing Google has really, really been focusing on the production uh, by the characteristics, which is cool. So, yeah, this is where you see models go from what would normally be 70 meg at runtime down to like 50K and 60K. So this is um, right, like the difference of uh, being able to actually deploy on the sensor or not deploy, right? Um, I heard some other story too where I think the Apple Store uh, or the App, App Store or whatever, uh, yes, any single asset can't be above 100 meg. And if you're trying to upload you know, these like 32-bit weights and there's you know, tens of thousands and millions, um, it just literally like you can't deploy on, um, like the app store. Um, okay, let me just think this is, yeah, so this is actually, here I've got production, but um, yeah, this can actually run on the local Kubernetes. This is where we're gonna start using Istio. Yeah, right, does anyone here like have any experience with yeah, Istio? It's a, you know, routing. Um, what's cool is that it has a lot of the like Netflix circuit breakers and all that stuff and um, really, really surgical routing. So like you could actually trigger off of um, a header or a customer ID within the page. You know, there's, there's like a million different options and route traffic. And so the way that we're like highlighting it here is we've got this model that's out there. That's the current model. Um, I'm gonna route, so I've got two new models that I'm trying to test. I'm trying to test the GPU version and the TensorRT version or something. And, um, but I don't wanna just kind of release it to the hounds, right? Cause I might just get horrible predictions and I've done all my stuff offline and it seems like it should be good, but there's always that, that little, you know, birdie in the back of your head that's saying this is just gonna fail like miserably, right? So in like a fraud type thing, it would just be fraud, 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 fraud. Um, and so what you wanna do is really get like a relative, you know, so here's my uh, like control model um, and here's my two experimental models and Compare system metrics, of course, latency and that kind of thing. 
Um, but there's one dashboard I'll show here in a slide or two that actually shows the predictive uh, like performance. So for the, the same set of like inputs, um, show me what is each model actually predicting. And there's ways to quantify that, right? So if you're dealing with like search results, for example, um, and you're trying to compare like model A's, you know, top 10 to model B's top 10, this is a classic set similarity problem. And you can see, you know, if you run uh, like Jacquard similarity, something like that, you'll get some number and show relative to, the, to that, uh, like control model A, B is, you know, down is like way off and, you know, C is kind of tracking okay. So let's uh, keep an eye on C. And like you can actually start to shift traffic over. Um, yeah, this is all CLI, but there's obviously an API. Uh, and I can now start to say, okay, I'm gonna you know, slowly shift traffic over to A or to C and you know, try it out. This is this whole, like this classic multi-arm bandit thing, right? So it's kind of like an A-B test, but it's a little bit more dynamic. It's not pinning you, um, you know, to a super shitty model for like two weeks it will slowly kind of, you know, try out the early winners, right? The multi-arm bandit, kind of the slot machine thing. You're presented three slot machines. One seems like it's paying out really well, but you still want to explore, right? Like you don't want to just, just keep pulling that winning one. You still want to kind of dabble because maybe that was an early winner just, you know, based on chance. And then, you know, B and C, uh, or yeah, so C ends up being the winner. So you can kind of experiment that way. And then you can actually stop uh, the experiment earlier than you would with the, a uh, like classical A-B test because you would be draining that um, three model, right, like the experiment. Once you kind of drop below, you know, if there's only 5% value left in this, which there's statistical ways to like calculate this based on how long and uh, how far ahead the other ones are and that kind of thing, um, you can then stop the test early, which is huge because now you're not screwing the other, you know, if C was always the clear winner, for those two weeks, I'm still sending 97% you know, traffic to A, which is clearly not the winner. And it, um, yes, a winning model is up to you, right? So it's up to the data scientists. Just think of a little function, you know, in the serverless world, this is what we provide, uh, where they're getting feedback from these models and uh, really you decide which one, you know, based on a certain threshold. One thing that like we see quite a bit is that this decision to start shifting traffic could take two weeks or two months you're not always sure you know like based on what you're actually testing if you're testing you know whether or not in a single 30 minute session this person signed up or you know whatever yeah that's okay you can kind of keep that uh, like data around and then shift um, but if your like reward function you know is something that that could potentially take two months then um, starts getting a little hairy so yeah stagemaker is really cool check that out they give you ways to actually split the traffic. They don't do the routing for you, but like you could say, right, like Model A, start taking 97% or, you know, uh, and start doing that shifting. Um, what was interesting is when the SageMaker thing was released, uh, they actually supported TensorFlow better than Google. So the, the, and this is actually still kind of the case, Google Cloud ML Engine um, is a bit of like, I still don't know how anyone's using the service because it, it just doesn't work, right? Like at least for like the ways I've been uh, like using this and I'm sure I'm gonna hear about that uh, when I post this video, but um, yeah, there's like, when this came out, this was supporting the latest 141, uh, so potential is up to 1.5 now. There were a ton of examples like that were using all the brand new APIs that like you couldn't find anywhere on the Google site or the uh, TensorFlow site. Um, I don't know much about Azure. My joke is, um, yes, I lost my Hotmail password, you know, about 15 years ago in college or yeah, 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, I can't log into Azure ML. So uh, I tried the forgot password, but it was to, a, you know, some old phone number I had or whatever. Right? Uh, so here's that kind of magical dashboard I was talking about. There's the offline metrics on top. So there, like you see, C is actually doing pretty well. It's um, you know, yes, I have little kind of green check marks that are hard to see, but offline C is doing well. The relative, so think, you know, there's accuracy and then there's precision, which is more of a relative type thing. So C and A are a bit more precise than the control, you know, A and B. B is just, and you know, this is just some like arbitrary way to quantify the outputs. Um, you know, if it's Jacquard similarity or some, some way to take a prediction and uh, make it a number that can then be plotted. Um, 
And then of course there's the, the like sort of systems -y type things, you know, throughput. Um, one thing I'll show here in a sec uh, on the slide is that we actually compare, um, uh, so the like sort of like killer demo here that we did was we, we spun up uh, two similar instances or, or two clusters, one in Google and then one in Amazon. And they were similarly priced. Um, I think Amazon, uh, oh yeah, so the Amazon instances were actually half priced because um, we started with spot instances, right? Which is that, that you know, cool, um, but it's not guaranteed. And so, uh, yeah, so all traffic was being served with a little bit of traffic still being served in Google because we still want to explore. Um, but, you know, we were right, like heavily, um, right, like uh, shifting traffic to those cheaper instances. So there's this uh, like metric that we added, which is cost per prediction. So we know um, the cost of these instances per hour per minute, and we are calculating the throughput. And so of course we can back into cost per prediction. And once that started, uh, yeah, so we still had ones in Google, we lost all of the spot instances, and now the Amazon ones were more expensive and Google was cheaper. And then we actually shifted traffic, right, like 99% or whatever over to Google. So that was really cool. Um, and because we're sort of tapping into the stream, this is a case where, so while you can, you know, graphically show that precision and, you know, how A and C are predicting relative to each other, um, like there's still something in the back of your head that maybe the function that you use to calculate this is jacked up. So you then um, can go here and we're sampling from the stream, from this prediction stream, Yes, we're using Kafka and or like all the normal stuff. So for the same inputs, like we could actually see, right, these uh, like predictions, confidence values. So they're all coming in um, at uh, two, which is the mm -hmm. highest. You know, this is a, um, uh, um, what's it called, softmax layer showing. Um, and we're just taking the highest and then that's the index um, of what's being passed in. This is the MNIST thing where you pass in handwritten digits in it. And so this is where you'd see, oh man, so C actually was doing really well, but you know, for, right, like for example, C is actually showing it's coming in at seven or something. So, you know, kind of gives you uh, sort of a visual thing. This is one thing that we didn't start off building, but because we're able to tap into the stream, we kind of proposed it to a couple early people and they're like, yes, that's exactly what we want. Like, just to make sure, you know, visually. Um, this is all done through Python. I kind of have the, yeah, so those are all um, pip installable open source uh, libraries for these predictions. Um, one cool thing too is that you could actually tap in and, you know, see how much time is being spent. Uh, there's kind of three logical steps here. There's, you know, taking the JSON, converting it to a, to a tensor, actually running the prediction, and then going back from a tensor back to uh, your JSON. Here's where we're shifting the traffic. Uh, more shifting traffic. And this is, yeah, where we trigger on the cost per prediction. <clears throat> so there's one final thing here too that's like super cool. And then I think I'll do some demos. Actually, I have a bunch of slides on, uh, yeah, like Kubernetes and Istio. Too. Well, I have like 15 <laughs> slides. Yeah, about 15 slides. So I was talking about these confidence values back here. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst case scenario here, right? This is pretty obvious that two is coming up the highest, right? These are really small numbers, but yes. Yeah, so what's the worst case scenario? Like they're all like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, right? Yeah, every prediction comes back and it's not confident. And it's, you know, hard to tell, or they're like within some tolerance, right? 0 0.99, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 right? like things like that, 0 0.01. Um, so, because we actually have these confidences and because we're tapping into the stream, right? Like you can kind of see how this stuff evolved, right? We built one thing and then we're like, oh yeah, let's you know, do one more thing. Um, this one uh, like user actually came up with this thought that maybe for the unconfident prediction, so this is an extreme case where it's all point one, you know, this is manufactured. Um, so certain ones we could actually send off to a separate Kafka topic, right? Or just some, some you know, storage mechanism, some, some place um, that we've identified. These are unconfident predictions. We've provided um, a response, yes, in real time. We, we've you know, given them an answer. We probably just made something up with like this kind of thing. Um, but we are 
right? Like now going to actually send this to Slack and then the sort of internal team, um, it like starts off with kind of or like just the data science team itself can kind of go here at lunch and, you know, kind of sift through and right, like relabel this data or like label this data. This is unlabeled data, this is unseen data. And so now we're actually creating training data, which is the holy grail here, right? Like we always want more data. And this is human trained and like you can tune, you know, and you can sample and you can not, you know, flood these channels. Um, but yeah, so here's a case where I was presented to and then what was predicted um, because we're, you know, tapping into that. And then I respond with the correct value. And then now that's a label uh, on or like that image and that goes back into training and then we, yeah. Uh, and so you can gamify this and uh, the holy, the, the best way to gamify is not necessarily how many you, you know, corrected, you know, cause that's just kind of a, um, just a simple metric, but how much did the predictions get better in the future based on your feedback? And there's still, you know, we're still trying to figure out how to best quantify that, but that's, um, and so what's cool is because that gets old pretty quickly and you, you can't spend your entire lunch doing this. Um, so they can now get right, like Crowdflower or the Amazon Turk people involved and um, can do this all day. Yes, yeah, so all they have to do is connect to that Slack channel, uh, private channel. So continuous model training, that's, yeah, that's the holy, well, that's the idle, but leads to the holy grail, I guess. Um, is where you are you know, taking data off of a stream and continuously updating weights. So that's one cool thing about these neural networks is that they can always, they're like always set, right, like to be retrain or to like take more data and can rather like operate on sort of incremental, you know, data that's coming in because they're, and in fact, this is a celebrated part of these neural networks because you could take somebody else's training Right, like the Inception Network, for example, from Google, you know, has been trained on millions and millions of like images and you know edges and different backgrounds, and I want to reuse that now for my domain, which you know could be porn detection or you know could be um, people putting in phone numbers uh, if you're trying to do like something like uh, right, like Airbnb and trying to kind of game the system. You're you're trying to find fraud, and you could recognize you know, numbers inside of. Um, right, like, yeah, full, like, phone numbers. So uh, I think, let me just go through the slides real quick. Um, I'm just going to flash through them. Yes, yeah, so I'll post these. Uh, does anyone know Christian Posta? He's a Red Hat dude. Uh, he's been involved in pretty much every single Kubernetes. There was Fabricate and Function with a K, which they've ended up sunsetting. Uh, he's worked on pretty much, yeah, he's like Mr. Kubernetes. Um, so he has a really good blog. Uh, I talk to him quite a bit. I tend to, to flood him with a lot of questions, so I've had to learn to uh, throttle that a little bit. But he um, is part of Istio and you know the Envoy project, and he's got this workshop uh, that's really cool that kind of explains Istio and um, how it uses Envoy. Uh, yes, yeah, so Ingress. So think of Ingress as you know. So there were services that that first came out with Kubernetes, and that was a way to you know like load balancers. And they didn't quite get it right, so they did this layer on top that's called ingress. And now you could do routing, um, you know, based on uh, packets coming in or the path. And this is what like Istio has their own, uh, it's the ingress controller, it's called. And so these controllers in Kubernetes, uh, just in case, right, like you're not familiar with it, um, they, so they look at the current state and look at what you're trying to do, and they right, like, try to achieve that. And this is, it's the same way with this, um, you know, so when I call and change the routing, I'm, right, yes, I'm telling, um, right, like this cluster, this uh, like ingress controller, that this is my desired state and do whatever you have to do to do that. So that term controller comes up quite a bit. You know, there's all kinds of different controllers, not just routing controllers, but um, yeah, we're currently like doing some cool stuff with like federated, um, you know, cross uh, cloud, Kind of stuff. So there's the ingress controller. There's actually three main ones. Or yeah, from like what I see, there's the Google provided one that, that you have to use Google Cloud. Uh, there's the Nginx guys. I actually had an Nginx guy at my meetup um, yeah, last month, and well, he was like, "Why do you use this deal? Why don't you just use our stuff?" And I presented this use case about shifting traffic, and he's like, "Oh yeah, that's our paid product." And I'm like, "That's why I'm not using it, right? Because I could do this with yeah, you know, we're a small company. We 
are you know building a product that could be deployed elsewhere. And you know, if I go to a VC and say, yeah, I have to give half of our you know, revenue to uh, the Nginx guys, um, they're not going to hand over those fifteen hundred dollars per star. So yeah, one thing the highlight of this slide is. Yes, Istio depends super heavily on this project called Envoy, which is a C++ uh, layer. And this is, you know, there's a sidecar running alongside, um, in our case, the machine learning model. So there's our machine learning model and the runtime is in one Docker container. Um, and there's a sidecar that has to travel with it. That's actually taking the, traf the you know, traffic and then routing it. And that's, that's really all done in this Envoy C++ layer. Envoy comes from Lyft. Uh, one sort of anecdotal thing about Lyft, they are soaking up all of the best talent in uh, like San Francisco right now. All my friends are, yes, that's the assumption that all my friends are the best talent. Um, but yes, all the people that, that I really respect um, are you know, coming out of Uber. Uh, I think Lyft just, just got a bunch of funding maybe this summer. Um, but like literally they took the San Francisco guy uh, who works for the data artists and people, the Flink project, they snagged him. Um, so he's not doing Flink anymore. Well, he's probably doing Flink, but at Lyft, um, they're trying to catch up to you know Uber. But yeah, they're soaking up everyone. The the guy who created Airflow um, from like Airbnb, uh, you know, um, yeah, Max, uh, is now um, at Lyft, and yeah, like there's a lot of this happening. So let's see. Yeah, just know it can do, oh, and then this is how we're doing these canary deployments. This is how we're doing, you know, the AD tests and the like multi-arm bandit routing. Um, there's a lot of metrics being pumped out of this layer from, from Envoy. Um, in my demo, which I'll run super quick, um, has Grafana and, you know, shows a lot of that stuff coming out. Um, if you're not familiar with these CRDs, it's the new term for the uh, third party library, the T TPAs or the TPRs or whatever they were. Um, yeah, this is the new thing. So this is where you can customize uh, like Kubernetes. And, um, you know, now I can build a concept and have it participate in this controller, you know, sort of pattern. Um, and so you, you build a CRD, which these SEO guys have done, and you declare what your current routing rule is, and it's going to shift all the traffic. So, um, this is the actual rather Istio uh, like configuration. I say I want version, you know, A, have 97, B2, blah, blah, blah. And you could slowly kind of shift traffic that way. One cool thing about Istio is that uh, when you scale out, so if you go from five servers or, you know, like five of these model servers, these uh, like containers to 10, it will continue to maintain that same split. Right, so naturally, if you didn't have any router layer, and you had 97 of you know one container, yeah. So right, like before Istio and like before the Nginx routing, what you had to do was uh, spin up 97 of right, like model A, uh, two of model B, and one of model C, and that's how you got that split, which is you know um, that's not very cost effective. Um, yeah. So you could actually, yeah, people are using this to shadow uh, prod traffic. This is um, something that right, like we're also doing. Uh, you can trigger off of headers, you know, username, anything in the payload. Uh, destination policies, this kind of feeds into, right, like how do you actually choose? Is it these connections currently? Is it random? Is it uh, round robin? You can play with a lot of these. And there's an egress part of this too. So typically what you want to do is lock down all of your stuff so that no one can get on there and call something else. But you can poke holes and say, well, I want these containers to still be able to talk to the API um, or some you know, specific set of servers. Um, supports uh, chaos uh, monkey, um, you know, latency monkey. This is actually the scariest monkey. This is kind of Netflix stuff. Um, really back when I was there, we, when I first started, we were developing chaos monkey, which would kill these, you know, um, as at the time it was, you know, kill the Amazon instances. Now we're just killing containers and making sure we can adapt and, you know, that that controller's doing its job and spinning up new ones. The most feared though, and I mean, I didn't even realize this until we started using it, uh, is the latency monkey. So it's really easy to deal with failure because you can just spin up a new instance. 
uh, it's really hard, not unless you've really, really tuned your timeouts. And so this is what actually brought out like a whole ton of teams that were like, holy shit, we didn't realize that you know, our timeouts were five seconds. And this backs up when you have a bunch of services that depend on other or like microservices. Um, if those like timeouts aren't set properly. Uh, and so um, with just a tiny bit of configuration, like you could actually start to introduce, you know, seven second delays here and there and see how things uh, like adapt. So here's some of the, this is a uh, dashboard for like Istio and you can see the different versions. Um, that's kind of a cool one up there, the upper right, uh, where you could just get a quick, it's just doing the dot biz or whatever that thing is. Uh, and showing the splits, you, you get you know, kind of a quick, um, right, like my splits are actually taking effect. Uh, I think that's, that's Prometheus. There's Zipkin support too as well. And Zipkin lets you actually trace a single request through the entire system. And this just occurred to me today actually when I was putting together these slides that uh, there's this like thing about machine learning where you need or want the explainability, right? And we're starting to see more and more people ensemble together models. And what I really want to see when I make a prediction is not just the prediction, but what models and what versions of those models did that prediction come from? And as we're, we're, we're starting to see more and more ensembling, uh, that's an area that's not really being addressed. And it like, it like hit me that like, oh man, I could use Zipkin for this. So typically, so Zipkin came out of Twitter. Uh, I think it's part of Finagle or something like that. Uh, it was a way for them to, to see performance, right? And how much time is being spent and then they could, you know, send uh, the info back to the team that's responsible for that slow service. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from using it as an audit trail, right? And this is becoming more and more important, especially across Europe uh, where, um, you know, and so these neural networks suffer from the explainability problem. So yeah, even though I could show someone that it went into this neural network, I still don't know what the neural network did. Right, or how it got to that um, prediction. There's a whole field of study around that. Uh, security, I hate talking about security, so I'm just gonna. <laughs> and uh, yeah, please start. Do I have time for one demo? It's like literally, it's actually what was showing up, I think, when people were uh, showing up here. So here is, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start pumping a bunch of traffic. So this is that kube test thing I'm showing. Oh, and so this is all running locally. This is running um, on my local laptop that's running the latest Docker Edge with Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, like 182. And I've got, actually I can show you guys, kube cuddle. We've got our dashboards, we have, um, I trained two models. I trained one using, so this is the MNIST. I trained it using uh, 0.025 learning rate, which is, if, right, like, if you're familiar with gradient descent, it's kind of the step size as we're you know, going down um, to try to find that like minima. And then I used uh, 0.050. So I just have two different versions, two different um, uh, right, like learning rates. And now I'm just gonna pump a bunch of traffic and these are named appropriately up here, 025 and 050. So this is, you know, I've just deployed this. Um, oh, I kind of skipped this part with the routing. Um, so here, if I make it bigger, it's gonna be a little, oh, no, actually, it's not too bad. Um, this is the routing call that I had in the slides and saying uh, 0.90, so right now it should be doing 50-50. And I could verify that with my favorite little dot viz thing here. I just clicked on this, just a quick view. It's about 50, 58, um, right, like request per second, right? This is running on my laptop, so it's, it's butt ass slow. Uh, if I change the routing now to be 99 going to 025 and one, because maybe I've determined that uh, that 025 is actually better, but I still want to explore. <laughs> Um, that then instantly gets picked up and now we see a bunch of 025s and not many 050s. That's the first indication. Normally you probably wouldn't be looking at the logs like that as a data scientist. I could pop over here and I start seeing it shifting away. So 025 is actually getting more and more traffic. It's kind of settling down. Um, I could also look over here and I should see A getting the bigger blob and, um, or yeah, sorry, uh, the 025 getting the bigger blob and 050. 
Um, and also, here's the Istio stuff if you want to get really crazy in Opsy. Oh, this is all reproducible on your local machine. Uh, if you go to the, there's a quick start off of the pipeline um, uh, repo. So it would be pipeline AI. Actually, I always find it, I just go here and I go to community, or no, click on the, yeah, so you can go to open source. It pulls it right up, right in the pipeline thing here. And there's a quick start and it shows all the instructions, all the SEO things. Um, I've been going through it the last couple of days, so I think it's in good shape. Thanks for having me.